Uh, welcome. Uh, very briefly, uh, just a few notices before we start. This is an informal gathering. Our session is being recorded uh, and it will only be broadcast uh, later. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please do switch off your camera and microphone. This is our last talk this season as part of our series on the living memory of cities. As you know, there's also another series we've been uh, doing in collaboration with Father Peter Newby from St Mary's University, who is also with us uh, today. And that's a series on sacred space. The last talk of that season will be on the 29th of March. That will be with Professor Fabio Barry from Stanford University, who will be talking to us on the question, why round temples? And we've been very much looking forward to hearing him on that topic, and we will do so hopefully uh, from our office. It will be uh, a so-called uh, hybrid uh, session. So the 29th of March and preparations for the coming seasons are already underway and sessions will recommence uh, in October as always. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Dagmar Motitska weston from the University of Edinburgh. Dagmar will be talking about a Roman theatre Senefrons as a thematic edifice. As always, the proceedings will be very simple. Eric will be chairing the session. Dagmar will be doing a keynote presentation for 30 or 40 minutes or so. And this will be followed by the usual period for questions. Uh, finally, a note to thank uh, Joanne Gold, Nikolina Georgieva and Duncan MacDonald, who have been assisting with these sessions at Eric Perry Architects and our graphics team, in particular, Russell Watson, and Roman McCook, who've been updating our website and events program. And as well for me, I would give the floor to Eric. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Jose. And just to say, it's a huge pleasure. And, and I've certainly been, and I know we have been waiting eagerly for Dagmar's presentation. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I'm sure, going to be a, a wonderful finale to this season's, uh, this season's seminar. So, Dagmar, without further ado, and uh, with anticipation, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you see and hear me OK? I can't quite see myself here. Um, just by way of introduction, so I, my work in recent years has focused uh, a lot on the architectural facade as a communicative face of the building. And um, it has, the facade has obligations to enclose public settings and at the same time to act as a scenographic background to, uh, to the theater of civic life, the kind of performance that goes on in cities. Um, I, I have been aware for some time that the design um, of facades, particularly in schools of architecture that I've been in contact with, um, were often neglected or treated mainly as a formal concern. Um, and this is still, I think, the legacy of the modern movement, which, as we know, had issues with, with formal facades. Um, but in recent years, there has been a lot of new interest in, in the design of facades and a number of architects, for example, have spoken about this. Um, and it's something I mean, designing a facade as a communicative uh, element that's connected to a history, to a tradition, and yet is reinterpreted in modern terms is very important. It's something that, for example, Eric Perry architects have been doing uh, right from the beginning, I think. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight, the, the facade um, of, the, of the Roman theater as a thematic device, I'll try to explain that um, as I go along. Um, and particularly the facade's origins in theater. And I think one can think of theater as, a, as an archetype of architecture. Um, so this paper looks back mainly on the Roman theater facade and considers its origins um, and some of its meaning. Here are some uh, towered city gates. Um, on, the, you, on the top left, you'll recognize the gate of Ishtar in Babylon, um, and just below the Porta Marzia in Perugia. Uh, 
um, the highly developed edicular architecture of the scanner France may be seen to have its origin in two sources. One is the, the city gate here, and the other is the Greek theater stage building or scanner. Um, the city or palace gate was a primary site of religious and political ceremonies. Um, in addition to its protective power, the gate always had a symbolic and scenographic uh, function. It was generally a two-towered uh, structure with an arched gateway like this, um, where ceremonies and processions began. So it had sacred origins as well as uh, a defensive function, obviously. It was linked to the royal right of entry um, and a symbol of divine power and authority. One can see that very well in the Porta Marzia, for example, where the where the rulers are portrayed in a kind of heavenly loggia above the, the entrance to the city. So very important, the act of passing through, the ritual movement of passing through, um, sometimes conferred on the ruler a semi-divine divine status. Um, the other source of the scanne France was the stage building or the scanne of classical Greek theatre. Again, it had sacred origins. Theatre was um, part of religious celebrations uh, in Greece. And the, the, the stage building originated as a basic stage tent or hut. Um, it was a one-story uh, building with a central major door. Um, which would be flanked by two minor ones. And sometimes it had projecting wings like in this, um, in this painting at the top uh, right, There's projecting wings or porticos. Um, in the Hellenistic period, the scanne often developed into an elaborate two-story building in front of which stood a lower colonnade, its roof used as, a, as an acting area. It typically represented a palace or a temple. Um, it sometimes, sometimes they used painted panels on fabric uh, to represent other settings, but the temple or palace were uh, primary. So again, a, a, a sacred a domain. Um, the convention, conventions developed whereby the central portal of the Skene facade and the area beyond it belonged to the divine and semi-divine protagonists, while the uh, two side doors represented domains of less important characters. The whole Greek theatre building in its geometrical structure was a kind of microcosm. And what I mean there is that the, the round orchestra, sometimes surrounded with a, uh, with a water channel, um, was represented, uh, represented the earth um, often there was a, an underground tunnel which could be, which was used to represent the underworld in the place. Um, and the, the scanner building then became the kind of raised celestial realm where um, divinities appeared and so forth. So this, by the way, is the uh, theater of Priyan in present day Turkey reconstructed here. Um, the symbolically charged inhabited wall of this of the Hellenistic scanner would be assimilated into Roman theater, which in addition to its religious function would develop an important role as political propaganda. Um, the large image here is of the Roman theater at Orange with um, the seated figure of the emperor um, in the center. Uh, cheap and widely accessible to the citizens, theatre was a powerful way for the ruler to ingratiate himself with, its with the population. The tall, deep and highly articulated front wall of the theatre is a key step in the wider story of the facade. So it reached a highly developed uh, form in the theater of Pompey, that's about 55 BC. And then this architectural type uh, was spread around the empire, helping to cement Roman authority. So it becomes um, the familiar thing that we recognize. The facade's architecture of colonnades 
ediculi and sculpted scenes achieved its most elaborate form in the theater. It seems to have been influenced in the fronts of uh, by the fronts of imperial palaces on the Palatine Hill with their language of heavenly galleries and balconies of appearance, speaking of royal and divine authority. Vitruvius's instructions for the design of the tragic scene seem to confirm this interpretation. He calls for the use of columns, pediments, statues, and other objects suited to kings. Um, chief among these royal elements was often the arched Porta Regia, um, which we can see here. The function of the facade was to act as an extension on the, of the stage, providing an architecturally dramatic backdrop of the, to the performances. But equally importantly, it was a splendid visual composition glorifying emperors and divinities. To this end, it was often elaborately decorated with tiers of Corinthian colonnades, balconies of polychrome stones, uh, with gilded entablatures, inset paintings, and mosaics, and niches framing statues. Um, so the whole thing was reminiscent of a, a theatrical performance. With openings providing access and leading the eye to the space beyond, and with projecting balconies, the Scania France was a structure of ambiguous depth. As in Greek theater, it usually had a tripartite form, um, with a central royal portal, um, the, the regia, flanked by two subsidiary ones, the hospitalia, as you can see here. Sometimes there would be more elaborate um, forms as well. This, again, is a reconstruction of Orange. One of the best preserved uh, is the Roman theater at Orange, built by the Emperor Augustus. The Scania France here is unusual in that it has a two-story uh, central section. It has this uh, domicidal, uh, domical niche, um, which, um, which held the statue of the emperor, as I said. It also had in plan a semicircular exedra, which is the traditional honorific motif of um, statesmen and magistrates. Um, there was an interplay between orthogonal and curvilinear geometry, so the whole thing was quite, quite rich. The Scania Fronts was an architectural scaffold which served to organize and present painted scenes and statues. So it's, it becomes a kind of narrative framework, a thematic framework. With its hierarchical order and royal and celestial motifs, it represented an ideal city of the gods and also alluded to Rome's domination of the world, and the latter was, was quite important as it spread around um, the empire. There's also an ancient kind of um, analogy between the city and the world, and as this is representing a city, it can perhaps be seen as a representation of the whole um, oriented cosmos. Just to say something about um, the metaphorical sensibility of the Romans, as with most traditional cultures, the Romans possessed a strong metaphorical sensibility, I think, where things had multiple meanings. They were accustomed to seeing the world and architecture in symbolic terms. So this is evident, for example, in the Roman ideal geometric image of the cross embodied in the Cardo and the Decumanus and also the grid. These were deployed in the division of, of land um, and the founding of towns and temples. So they were both a practical organizational tool and a deeply symbolic sacred schema essential for propitious building. The Romans understood space as oriented and meaningful. The vertical dimension linking the underworld with the earth and the heavens was particularly significant. So height um, denoted um, exalted godlike status, which is why the temples are, are generally raised on, on steps. The height of the staircase depending on the, on the seniority of the god. Um, Architectural elements were then thus understood symbolically. 
So the staircases, as I said, were an index of elevation. Processions typically ascended from low points to high. Um, and even things like gables and pediments and uh, arch keystones were seen as analogies to the hierarchical structure of the cosmos and of Roman society. Um, uh, the Romans were thus um, accustomed to reading facades, and the scan of France <coughs> has to be seen in this light. A good record of what Roman theatre may have been like is to be found in contemporaneous Roman wall painting. A reciprocal relationship existed bet between imperial palaces and theatre. While the Scanna France was informed by the ornate uh, royal facades, theatre itself became a model for the illusionistic wall painting decorating some imperial interiors such as this one at the House of Augustus on the Palatine. <coughs> Imaginary theatre scenes as wall decoration were also fashionable among patrician families whose grand frescoed residences are known to us today, chiefly through from Pompeii. Many of the four style frescoes depict reimagined ethereal variations on the scan of France, evoking ideal cities. Set into this ar these architectural frameworks, as in real theatrical performance, are sometimes scenes of figures framed in ediculi as they are about to make their entrance into the room or posed in dramatic mythological tableau. Um, so this is when divine beings seem to enter into the daily domain of, of mortals. In these images, an external wall treatment is transposed to the interior elevation, becoming a fictive architecture designed to dissolve and dematerialize the solid enclosure of rooms. The illusionistic facade of this period becomes very light and delicate, a scaffold of layered virtual architectural elements, opening views into fictive urban landscape and peristyle gardens beyond. Um, this is um, the famous North Tri uh, Triclinian uh, of the House of the Vettii at Pompeii. Sometimes as here, uh, the whole room is animated by dramatic mythical scenes so that the fictive performance by Olympian gods and heroes is directed towards the house's occupants, um, including them in the drama and asserting their high social status. The trompe l'oeil scan of France is here a mysterious and spatially ambiguous oscillating structure reminiscent, I think, of, of cubist space. Um, uh, this is the theatre of Pom Pompey reconstructed uh, in various ways. Um, and the, the image on the right is a sculpture of, of a Roman with ancestral masks. Um, the cultivation and perpetuation of collective memory was an important strand in Roman culture with its emphasis on ancestral traditions and military achievement. Much of Roman architecture had a commemorative and propagandist function. Um, the theater and the porticus of Pompey, which is here, um, you can see on the top right, um, comprised a, a large public garden and the curia, large enough to compete with, with the forum. Pompey's theater contained uh, a temple of Venus of Victory, who was she was his protectress so there's this that's very significant religious element to it um the scan of france was decorated with columns paintings and statues brought back from pompey's military campaigns campaigns <clears throat> um, later his gigantic statue was installed in the scan of france so the architecture represented a kind of permanent triumph ceremony for, for the emperor, for, for Pompey. Um, this is a, a reconstruction of the theater at Aspendos in present day Turkey. Um, 
In addition to general commemoration, it seems likely that some Roman architecture was conceived as a vehicle for artificial memory, with certain scanner fronts um, intended to be understood as a mnemonic device. Um, so we know that rhetorics was a highly prized skill in Roman public life, and part of its teaching was the training of the art of memory with a sequence of distinctive architectural places serving as containers um, uh, for the images, um, uh, for the uh, orator's topics, uh, one can see the, you know, one can see something like this as a, as a training ground for, for the theatre of memory, for the art of memory. These items could then be retrieved by the orator during his imaginary walk around the memory building while giving his speech. A hierarchically ordered facade encrusted as this one with niches and balconies, many containing statues may sometimes have been understood as such a set of topoi, a memory palace. This is our argument. This is an argument that's put forward primarily by John Anions um, and Edmund Thomas, and I think quite convincingly so. Um, a building type specifically developed for the construction and perpetuation of collective memory was the triumphal arch. And there is a formal and thematic kinship, I would argue, between the three bay arch and the tripartite theatre facade. The arch of Constantine here is a late example of, the, of, of this very ancient type. The arch was a key part of the magnificent architectural scenography for the Roman festival of the triumph, um, which was an elaborate victory parade and religious um, rite. At the same time, it was a permanent memorial to the military leader's achievements and semi-divine status. As in the theater, the structure and surfaces of the arch were used to tell stories, to record the official victorious narratives of the triumphator's conquests. The deed, um, was thus commemorated just at the time of passing through the arch, linking the triumphal, uh, triumphal memory with the act of penetration. Um, so quite often the arches were decorated within uh, in the vault. So as the procession passed through, the, the full meaning would be experienced as it were. Uh, during the ceremony, the triumphant commander and his uh, entourage processed through a series of significant places, culminating with the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. The triumph ceremony was developed in Republican Rome as an adaptation of an Etruscan rite, where the triumphator passing through the city gates was received as a god, um, an omnipotent ruler of heaven. So the arch here is at once a surface to be looked at, a thick portal for transformative movement, and finally a permanent urban memorial. Um, the architectural motifs of the scanner fronts were absorbed into Byzantine and early Christian iconography of sarcophagi and some church buildings. Um, they would become characteristic of Christian art and architecture, which in uh, much of which represents the heavenly kingdom on earth. A particularly good illustration of such thematic assimilation are the Byzantine mosaics adorning the dome of the rotunda of St. George in Thessaloniki, um, which, are, which is here uh, represented. This late classical imperial mausoleum was converted into a Christian church and its dome later decorated with four pairs of mosaic scenes, each depicting a two story, three portal screen or palatial facade. Constructed of jeweled arches, columns and tabernacles, they form a stage set for celestial uh, personages. So in this case, the martyrs which stand in front 
as they would have done in the in the theater. And this golden screen looks very much like the scanner fronts during a performance. The gold leaf, glass, and colorful stone tesserae of the mosaics vividly evoke the splendor and gold and precious stones of heaven and Jerusalem descending to earth um, at the revelation, uh, in Revelation. Um, curtains, you can see curtains suspended between some of the columns, which is uh, a very ancient um, element in, in religious iconography, but also in theatrical iconography. Um, and there's a kind of union, I think, uh, in the sacred theater here. This multiplication of fictive facades within the rotunda conveys the image of the city of God. And you have another image here, so you can see the way that these uh, scanner fronts motifs um, are repeated to make a kind of heavenly city within the dome. The highly ornate west front of the medieval Christian church took its form from the early Christian basilica. It echoes both the scanner fronts and the triumphal arch. You can see that, I think, here quite clearly. Some Provencal Romanesque churches manifest this class, these classical influences uh, very clearly. This is the case, in the, for example, in the Abbey Church of Saint-Gilles du Gard. Uh, where the three portals of the west facade are articulated by engaged and freestanding Corinthian columnar screens, framing life-size statue, life statues of apostles. Uh, the triple west portal continues the tradition of the Regia and the Hospitalia, with its three tympana, with its three tympana depicting triumphant Christian scenes. The central royal porch um, often depicts Christ in majesty, um, as is the case here. Now allied with Trinitarian symbolism, these buildings also express the nave and flanking aisles uh, form of the basilica type. The triumphal arch motif of the West Fronts, continuing the tradition in the tradition of celestial city as the imperial castrum, uh, continue to symbolize ritual movement and conquest of a spiritual kind, the transition towards the higher reality of Christian salvation. Um, the institution of the church is identified with the city of God and Christ is celebrated in the manner of the triumphant divine emperor. This is the west front of Exeter Cathedral, uh, with the image screen being built somewhat later between the 14th and into the 15th century. And the little image there is a, is a photograph of the choir singing from the west front of Lincoln Cathedral on festival days. In some cathedrals, fantastic screens and ediculi drape much of the west front, recalling celestial and royal arcades and framing in their galleries, as in the scanner fronts, figures of saints and kings. The vertical hierarchy of the world, from man to saints, angels, and ultimately to God, is essential to their order. Such edicular fantasies make explicit the iconography of the heavenly city in such English Gothic cathedrals as Lincoln or Exeter. The metaphor is underlined with ultimate, with utmost theatricality on festival days when an actual angelic choir sings from within the image screen to the people below so that the whole church structure seems to come mystically alive as a representation of the Christian cosmos. And I'd like to just mention here something that we talked about in an earlier session, the, the, the parallels between um, the, the theater facade and the iconostasis um, as a gateway to, um, to the divine and to redemption. In these reflections, I have tried to outline some of the rich symbolic tradition in which the architectural facade has its roots in theater. 
In this tradition, its space was oriented and meaningful, so it was uh, perceived in an embodied way, and it had connotations of the royal and celestial city. It also functioned both as a spatially ambiguous and uh, a spatially ambiguous surface and a portal for through movement. A building's facade is the key to the meaning of its interior, while also fulfilling an obligation to the public realm of its setting. I would like to suggest that a wider recovery of this tradition may contribute to the enrichment also of uh, today's city. Thank you. Yes, so incidentally, um, I use as my concluding image the um, uh, a frontispiece. Where I think there's an interesting story to be told of parallels between the theatre facade and a book frontispiece, but I think that's maybe for later, for another time. Thank you, Dagmar. And um, I'm, I'm sure that that will evoke a number of questions, so um, I'm, I'm looking for uh, the first. I think, uh, Jose, thank you. Wonderful. You're going to start us off. Thanks so much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dagmar, for your presentation, which I very much enjoyed. And I, I am sure that this period for questions will also allow us to uh, develop some of the topics that uh, you've presented so aptly. One of the things that uh, I found was uh, curious about uh, your presentation, especially since we're talking about the living memory of cities, is also the uh, use of the, um, well, the the life of the um, uh, facade of the Skenefrons um, itself. And the reason why I say that is because uh, in um, several examples, one that occurs to me, which is quite special is the, the theatre in Merida in yes. Spain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had a, a chance of seeing it. The, the, the details of that skin in France are quite uh, curious because um, so much of it is Here, somewhere. Sort of, Sorry, right? I had an image of it. Shall we find it or is it? Oh, just go on. Well, let me let me just describe it. Maybe I can describe it as a sort of um, uh, maybe I could paint a, a sort of uh, uh, image in words here, but the, there's a series of layers to the um, uh, Skene France, uh, which was originally built in brick and then covered in stone and then covered with another layer of stone. And then at some point they covered it in render, which painted render. And then at, at some point, there's another layer of stone or, or brick and so on and so forth. So clearly there was a, a long, ex, you know, an extensive life to the facade, uh, which is uh, kept in uh, the facade itself. You, you know, it, it still recalls, the, you know, even though we've forgotten it, the facade itself still recalls. Uh, all those uh, different uh, times and periods in which it would have looked differently. So I, I tend to look um, uh, with some suspicion at um, reconstructions, you know, the, the artist's impressions yes. of these things, because they would focus on un only one particular period. There would be a whole. So I was wondering whether you could say something more about that. Um, and then I think there's a whole wealth uh, uh, um, of history that goes with the basilica, basilical plan, the way it relates to the city, you know, so that would be another point, which I, I'm, I mean, I'm not expecting you to cover everything, but, but that's uh, orientation with respect to East and West and so forth. Yes, and, and the place of appearance and, and uh, the role of the king, the way in which that is brought to uh, Christianity. So I'm putting it only very schematically to open up uh, um, what I think is at stake here. Um, and now you, you're talking about the iconosis, iconostasis, if you say it in, in the Greek. But I think we're talking about uh, 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 um, an aspect, an aspect of uh, the of sacred history, which is so rich. I don't think we'd be able to cover uh, from the the difference that separates the nave and therefore the assembly 
to the presbyterion or the the place of uh, uh, um, where the the the, the ordained uh, would uh, uh, assemble and and celebrate, which would only be accessible there, uh, to the the uh, liturgical and and even biblical significance of that, the symbolism of the door. As you know, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need to go through the the narrow door, uh, or the uh, the the story which goes all the way back to early Christianity of the shepherd, um, uh, which I could probably uh, find for you. Um, yes. So just to quote. Um, the one not entering through the door into the courtyard of the sheep, but as ascending from elsewhere, that one is a thief and a robber. But the one entering through the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So, so this is very much reflected in the chancel in the church that eventually then uh, develops into the uh, iconostasis. Uh, but, you know, just to say what a wealth of, of material you've um, suggested to us, so much that could be covered. And if you could say something about that layering of the facade, that would be very interesting and I'm very curious about it. Yes, yeah, so so a problem with a talk like this um, or or an essay like this is that it's difficult to, you know, to get enough of <laughs> enough material in there. It is an incredibly rich rich area, which is why I think it's, you know, it should be of interest to contemporary architects because the traditions are, are quite rich. Yes, the theatre facade did change a lot. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of, of the theatre of Pompey, which was obviously important, the first stone theatre in Rome. It started out apparently on uh, the Scania France there as quite a simple, simple structure and was elaborated over, over years until it ended up, I think, in the form I showed was quite late on, and it's the form that appears in the in the famous marble plan of Rome. Um, that bit has been preserved. So that the fact that they kept spending money on it and redeveloping it confirms that it had a great kind of propagandist uh, function as well as, as serving the theater. And so subsequent rulers would um, remake it in their own image, uh, I think it was, must have been a very powerful uh, way of um, influencing the, the culture. Um, so, so yes, that, that's interesting. I didn't know that, that these layers are still available to be discovered at Merida, um, but um, I'll certainly have a look at that. The business of the orientation of basilicas, um, so I haven't um, found enough information onto, and I haven't spent enough time looking at how theatres were oriented. Certainly basilica, certainly sacred buildings, the, the idea of orienting east and west is very, very ancient. Uh, towards the sunrise, it's one of the kind of universal elements of, of religious buildings, I would say. Um, and so, so yes, so the west west face of the of the Christian Church, the idea that you come in from the west, the the domain of death, and then make your way towards rebirth, is uh, is fantastically uh, rich, I think, and, and people perceive it you know, continually as they enter these buildings. The door, of course, yes, it's a shame that we've lost so much of the sense of. The significance of of entering a building, a sacred building, which is why the doors are always so richly decorated with uh, with many layers of of symbolic content, and I tried to uh, show that a little bit at Saint Gilles, um, but pretty much any English cathedral you'd look at, you, you'd get a, a, a very rich sense of that. Um, yes, I think that's that's about it. Um, that's about all I can say at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well recovered, if I may say so, Dagmar. That's great. Um, thank you, Jose. Can we move to Christian? Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, it's something that obviously I've written about 
yes, uh, yes. as well in, in, in a lot of my work. And I thought there's a couple of things that I think are quite interesting in just sort of picking up on. One of the things is that uh, Hugh of St. Victor talks about in his di uh, Didascalicon the relationship of architecture to the, to the mechanical arts. And he relates it specifically to places for amusement and leisure. So the nature of the theatre becomes, in a sense, a critical part of the way, as well as uh, you know, that, that architecture, as well as armaments, which is another part of things like castles, which is the more sort of practical way. But I think that's a really interesting uh, uh, point to make out. But one of the things that, that I, I, I sort of picked up on a lot of this is the relationship that Gadamer talks about in his transformation into structure where he talks about the idea of um, the theatrical structure initially, um, particularly in relation to the, to the Greek polis and, and um, tragedy as, as being one of the moments where the articulation of um, the ontological structure of the society becomes transformed into the structure of the play. And of course, what's really interesting about this Skenai Frons is that it represents the next stage in that development where it emerges as a as a representation of the city replacing to a certain extent the chorus uh, the body of people of of the theater and then throwing that back in what's what's very interesting about the last bit you were talking about about in the cathedrals where the choirs sit uh, in a in a choir or stand in a in a choir balcony pretty much only on processional days it's not something they do every day but under certain uh, um, chants and responds when the processions approach the west front of the cathedral and then go through uh, the cathedral, that the relationship between the chorus, uh, the choir, which is obviously where the chorus comes, and the, um, uh, the body of the city in those two things is brought back together in a very very explicit way which is which is a very very interesting i think moment in in medieval uh, architectural history and of course then that's taken over to a certain extent uh, early very early on by charlemagne when he starts building his vestwerks where he inhabits that end of the church overlooking or facing the bishop at the other end and therefore this whole aspects of the city becomes also then through this transition a part where the king sits so you have the the two the two bodies represented within the building itself so very interesting it just those three things i mean you probably know all about that but i don't know if you wanted to comment on any of those well, yeah no i i appreciate you've been studying this very closely and you also spend time at lincoln which is one of the most wonderful <laughs> wonderful cathedrals where this kind of thing is, is is available to appreciate to people and i think these buildings are fantastically uh rich so um, so yes, thank you for that <laughs> comment. Um, I think following that, uh, Matthew is, uh, is is going to ask a question. Thank you. Um, you know what, um, Eric? I think maybe uh, a good idea to just go directly on to my colleague Jatze Ludwig Skarso, who I'm pleased to see is here, and then I'll come back afterwards. Well, let's let's do that. Yaki, please. Oh, thank you. Um, Dagmar, what a fantastic topic. So um, I don't know if you remember that I'm, I'm from a performance background. And so, um, so it's really interesting for me to, to attend this session and, um, and it's really, really inspiring. Um, so looking at it from a theatre kind of point of view, um, uh, I, was, uh, I couldn't obviously help but, but, uh, but, sort of, um, but think about the, the ideological uh, implications of, um, of the uh, Skene Fronts on, on the perception of theatre. So, so in a sense, when you've got um, that uh, the reminder of power behind the scene as the back of the, as, as the backdrop to to theatre, there is um, one could say that well, that's um, ideologically that's kind of that imposes a sense. It's a reminder of power in a way that a lot of modern theatre um, is you know no coincidence that a lot of modern theatre has gone so far away from the 
from that into the idea of the black box, the idea of, of the void um, as a way to tell stories. But what I'm really interested in is that in contemporary theatre, um, sort, of, sort of of now, of the theatre that I do, for instance, I love the idea of, 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 of kind of, of the relationship between the ephemeral and and what's around, you know, in, in, for instance, by doing site specific work, you know. Um, so, yeah, j just, um, I don't know, there's no particular question, but I was uh, wondering if you um, had any thoughts. I suppose one, one question that I was wondering whether the, uh, um, whether it's me trying to see something in it was um, that there is something uh, quite paradoxical um, in those uh, uh, Skinai Proms um, kind of constructions, because on the one hand, they give you the sort of reassurance of permanence. And uh, on the other hand, they are um, uh, acts of storytelling. So they also are reminders of the of um, ephemeral dynamic things that are changeable. Um, and I don't know whether it's me trying to see <laughs> something, but or if you had any thoughts on this. Well, yes, I think um, when I was doing this, I, I did find it interesting the extent to which theatre, which I've, you know, I've always gone to and loved mm -hmm. without really giving it too much thought, how much it had to do with power and staying in power and kind of propaganda for the particular person who uh, who built the thing, built the theatre and ran the, the city. Um, so, so yes, that's one thing. And then in contemporary theatre, of course, there's been a, or in modern theatre, there's been a move from the formality of the proscenium um, and the, the kind of all the iconography that went with it towards the kind of spaces and performances you, you describe, which was uh, very exciting. But at the same time, I suppose it loses something of the, the, the architectural uh, meaning. Um, I think site-specific theatre is very interest an interesting contemporary phenomenon because sometimes you can find, you know, very often you do find around London and elsewhere, fantastic buildings, sometimes quite decrepit buildings, which people don't get to see very much. And the theatre is completely transformed by people being able to, to walk around in these places. So that's, yes. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, I have... Um, I've stressed in my talk um, kind of tragedy, performance of serious plays, but of course in Rome, the comedy, the farce was equally as important. And it's perhaps slightly more difficult to imagine this very somber, authoritative, beautiful architecture being inhabited by, by, by clowns and farceurs. One, one thing that, um, one of my favorite musicals is, um, and it's been made into quite a good movie, is Stephen Sondheim's A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which is actually based on, on Roman comedy of, of this period. And I would recommend, you know, to anybody to Google it on YouTube. And there are, the musical numbers are available to be seen. And I think it gives quite a good, good idea of what Roman comedy was like you know, quite slapstick, certain yeah. kind of familiar motifs that repeated themselves. Um, and one can then imagine that going on in front of the scan in France. So do have a look at that. Definitely. Thank you very much. Really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question too. And uh, back to Matthew, perhaps. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just go back to something you said right at the beginning, which is um, the manner in which the uh, Skinny France can be seen as you can, you call it an archetype for for architecture or of architecture. And I wanted to, I mean, I think it's very interesting this um, this kind of almost paradigmatic function of especially the urban or, or civic facade that 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 it, that does invite interpretation even in relation to the questions I think that Jacek just had. Um, and uh, you then went on in your uh, text um, to say, to sorry to quote you back at yourself, but you talked about the narrative and ethical function of building facades is today generally much reduced, yet the need for them to perform their traditional scenographic role of lending cohesion and legibility to the city. And as this thematic support for public life is greater, than ever. And I was just thinking about, um, you know, a few examples um, 
uh, just coming back to uh, to 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 contemporary or recent architecture um, and thinking about some of uh, the layering of the facade, which Jose said, and, and the kind of implicit uh, perspectival and at once perspectival and at the same time pictorial character of some of those uh, um, uh, C9 Franz examples and also uh, paintings of them. And particularly you, you cited the, the um, House of the Betty in um, Pompeii. Uh, talking about that space as almost cubist, which was very interesting to me, um, and in relation to the idea of somehow deforming and populating and um, making more complex um, these spaces of appearance that seem to exist within the framework, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and with regard to what Jacek was just saying, the idea of subverting that hierarchy, I'm thinking of also contemporary reinterpretations like Giacometti's The Palace at 4 a.m., which seems to imply this sort of structure that can be appropriated. And in, in the few examples that just sprang to mind, were, well, the one was, um, I don't know if you've seen Patrick Lynch's uh, project, which is on site in Victoria for the library in Victoria. The other one is the kind of um, iconic um, Mercia Town Hall by um, uh, um, Raphael Moneo. And then, of course, the one that springs to mind for a number of us here would be um, Eric's facade at Finsbury Square, the sort of screen which is also slightly suggestive of, of, of all kinds of appearances that might exist behind it, including the play of light. And so I was just wondering about the, uh, the um, uh, let's say, longevity and possi possibility for uh, reappropriation and rethinking of this paradigm of the Sinai France is something that that does have these possibilities for appropriation, manipulation and reinterpretation. And if you've got some thoughts on that. Um, yes, that's a that's quite a large question. But first of all, um, the reason I felt I could call it cubist space is because it's ambiguous. Um, between two and three dimensions. It's it's not unified perspective yet, and it also seems to jump between a flat reading and, a, and, a, and an illusionistic reading. Um, and in that room that I showed, you really do get a very strong sense of it jumping between the two um, and the ediculi that frame the scenes, um, being both a picture plane and, a, and an illusionistic space. Um, so I think it's doing some of the same kinds of things. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, some of the examples that you mentioned of facades, which which try, which are like that, such as uh, Finsbury. Um, I like very much both that building and also the um, the town hall, which you mentioned, which I think is one of the best examples of how a facade can can be used for literally for theatre these days. That's why I use the image. Um, I think those are very, very interesting examples to, to, to develop and to follow. I think one cannot revert to um, anything resembling the scanner fronts too literally, because that would be far too literal. But one can, uh, as certain architects have done, uh, abstract it and reinterpret it in, in these kinds of ways. And obviously the openings and um, particularly the door doorways, the entrances are very significant, um, having to do with the meaning of the whole building and so forth. I'm not sure if I if I managed to <laughs> to say something about what you were particularly. No, well, you, you did. I, I just thought that that phrase archetype is interesting because I think this is a motif, a, a paradigm which seems to be very amenable to reinterpretation and it feels very modern in so many ways. Yes. So what I meant there was not, not just the facade, but the Greek theatre generally as a kind of archetype of architecture. This is something that was discussed at the symposium that Tracy and I um, took part in recently. Um, it's it informs, you know, certainly theatre buildings, um, but also other kinds of architecture throughout uh, throughout Western history, and um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you buy my interpretation of the Greek theater as a, as a, as a microcosm with the, with the earth and the underworld and the celestial domain. But if you do, then I think that one can see it as, a, as an architectural arch archetype of which the facade is a, is a component. Particularly, I suppose, having to do with the divine realm, with the celestial region. Um, maybe I could just mention something that I thought would be interesting to talk about um, is this question of, of tradition, because it's something that has really informed many of these talks and how one can, you know, I think this this kind of very quick scan of history of a particular element shows how through history, the tradition, people work in the tradition, but readapt it to whatever cultural context uh, they are working within. And it's very fruitful, and yet it's reinterpreted in completely different ways. So from, you know, from Roman tragedy to celebrating um, Christian redemption. Um, and and it did that kind of layering which is possible makes it very, very rich. And that seems to me something that is unfortunate that we've largely lost in the modern period, that it's much more difficult to work within the tradition. And um, I've been really um, fortunate to, to be able to look closely at the work, for example, of, of Eric's uh, practice, because there I think that that kind of thing happens more than in many others uh, architects work. And I think it's, it's really, you know, very fruitful. One of the things, if, if I may interject, one of the things that I, I find, uh, well, there are two things actually, that I find um, uh, thought provoking uh, have to do really with the uh, the life of of the Sene France as as uh, as you're describing it, um, uh, and one was raised by Jacek, uh, and it has to do with the permanent structure of the Sene France, the regardless of the place being done there. I'm sure there would have been many uh, temporary structures which uh, have, have disappeared uh, entirely. I mean, even close close to us uh, up until the 17th century, 18th century, many of them would have been up for one night and a one performance and uh, there would have been, you know, uh, gone. So nothing is, is left, very little is left. Um, and uh, in contrast, the, the stone structure uh, of the Sene France, so going back to the Skene of, of the Greek theatre, would be there. So that's, I think, uh, puzzling. You know, uh, how would that uh, how would that work? Um, then the other thing has to do with the structure of the Skene France, uh, which is unlike that of any other ordinary building in any city. I mean, you wouldn't have not even the, the Roman temples look like that. No, but I gather that quite a lot of it was based on the um, on on palaces, on uh, imperial palaces. And if you um, look at those, quite a few of them, particularly the, the, the gallery or the loggia, which was uh, really uh, connected with a kind of celestial situation that, you know, the, the people who resided there were godlike or were gods. So so the this kind of France picks that up uh, and it's a sort of framework in which uh, figures are are made uh, are being shown as being divine by in by inclusion in this in the celestial structure um, yes oh I also wanted to say that the in terms of more uh, kind of applied uh, scenography uh, there were there were also mosaics, sometimes paintings on, on, on canvas, I imagine, that were brought in to, to, so there would be a certain amount of illusionistic representation to suggest a location. Some theatres had enormous hundreds of statues, some of, as I said with Pompey, some of which were looted from places and brought back, you know, to show his conquests. 
Um, so it would have been quite a busy, <laughs> busy scene, I think. Um, as for more temporary kind of structures, I I know that in Greek theatre they had these these constructions which were triangular in plan, so that they there would be a, a painted stage set on each of the of the three faces, and these were rotated during the play. They stood on the sides of the scanner, and they would be rotated to suggest a, a different locale. But as I understand it, the permanent the building was very much linked with you know, the domain of the of the divine protagonists. So so the kings and the and and gods. I'm sure there'll be plenty more to, to say. I'm afraid Eric has lost his connection there, but uh, uh, Tracy, would you like to take over? Yeah, um, let me just undo my hand. Um, so, I mean, there's so many crossovers that I see um, between your work and the things that I'm doing, which are kind of completely different. But um, it, the the research that I did on uh, theater and temples in Bali, where there's a very similar kind of tripartite structure, you know, leaving aside many other aspects of the ceremony, which is actually it's played out but it's also kind of in it's embodied also in the architecture but the kind of uh if i give it the name the eregia uh, in the temple is actually for the gods to come out of rather than for people to enter because even the priests basically don't use that uh main door they go in through the side doors to do what they have to do in the in the sanctum sanctorum and then there's this you know there's a very interesting way that um that coming out of that door is the way that you get a body as a god to kind of participate and to come you know sort of come into into the village and there's a very strong identification of that facade the external facade which then when they do theater even for tourists um that facade shows up as a as a kind of a reference representation of the space of the city and you become one of the villagers who's watching um, this divine spectacle of embodiment i think it's really interesting to to think about the uh, disappearance of the proscenium um, in those terms like if we start to really understand the origins of it in religious ceremonies then in a post like in a kind of secular world where you know which is sort of most of the theater that we're talking about the proscenium has to go because people are not like there's no god becoming embodied in a kind of sacred moment instead the whole there's there's a kind of total shift so i was thinking about this in terms of the facade and i realized that i've been looking a little bit at bruno zibi and his uh invariables and you know the in the organic uh architectural movement and the idea that you should uh the building should express you know sort of on the exterior in an organic way what's happening on the interior and i realized that because modernism had this uh representational paradigm shift away from or away from iconic to indexical that essentially something similar has to happen but it will never be the same and therefore can never kind of replicate uh, the tradition in the same iconic way you know to and I, and I think you're absolutely right I mean I really understand that if there is a theater of memory that is happening in the same way as the apprentice piece of the book tells you gives you a roadmap, pictura, of what you will encounter when you enter. Um, but we don't really have, as a kind of part of modern language of architecture, we don't have that anymore. We must, lead, we must find traces or kind of the results of processes which are now showing on the exterior of the building, and therefore this sort of translates into uh, into um, 
into the theater, the theater of, of like in, in situ types of performances and so on. But then the last image that I just wanted to leave everybody with was uh, one of my favorite theaters, which is the Academic Theater in Mantova. I don't know if you know it, it's a Bibiana theater in which when you're inside it, you really know that you're in a public square, even though of course you're in an interior because it has all the balconies, you know, of a kind of Northern Italian town at a miniature scale. It, the theater is the city and I absolutely, you know, I think you're right about this reciprocity. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a pity that we've lost that in, in much of contemporary theatre. I mean, it's it's great that theatre has become liberated from from the proscenium, but to have lost the image of a of the city that lasted for hundreds of years, many hundreds of years, is a is a pity. But very well. So thank you very much, everyone. I, I don't know if there are any more. Uh, question. Otherwise, um, we would close it uh, for now. I'm sure it's it's a conversation that we will continue on email and, and uh, perhaps even in in uh, future sessions. Uh, thank you again, Dagmar. Thank you.